This last chapter of our introduction to network analysis applied to history is not a conclusion. Rather, it is an opening to some of the challenges that currently occupy our community. Even more than the pre previous chapters, it can only be a very brief evocation, as these questions are of crucial importance for the development of the discipline. I therefore want to evoke in particular the notion of temporality, as well as that of multilayer system. First of all, the study of temporality is the foundation of historical studies, of course. Without the flow of time, there is, there is no object of study. Secondly, the question of multilayer and scale is one of the greatest promise of digital history. To be able to go from the local to the global and vice versa, to be able to take into account the effects of what happens down below on what happens above, etc. Taking temporality into account in network is above all a question of visualization and exploration. Indeed, it is not conceptually complicated to imagine that relationships can have a beginning and an end, or a unique moment of existence. It's therefore quite natural to model networks that change over time, that take into account what happened before or what will happen after. Uh, this task is often facilitated by the rigor with which historians are accustomed. All information is supposed to be dated, etc. It's obviously more complicated when we are talking about interpersonal social networks that are not based on historical sources that can be formalized, uh, but solutions can be found. When does a friendship begin and end, for example? Good question. But technically, the implementation of these good ideas is really a problem. We lack the tools and probably the creativity to invent solutions uh, that allow us to explore temporal networks efficiently. In fact, we are limited by our own ability to read a changing graphical representation or to understand the evolution of a structure in a complex data set. I don't necessarily go so far as to say that this is a definitive cognitive limitation, but it probably has a lot to do with the fact that we are not used to seeing a network evolve. We'll look at a few ways to do this, but since an HNR lunch lecture was held very recently on the subject, I'll refer you to this talk by Ramona Holler. I also refer you to Claire Le Mercier's article, Taking Time Seriously. The search for solutions to represent temporality in networks is not a recent phenomenon, as this three decade old example shows. While we usually try to date the relations, this visualization shows that we can also date the vertices of the graph. Here we see the proximity of charities in New York at the end of the 19th century. The vertices are placed on a vertical timeline at the moment their first relationship appears. This does not account for the fact that most of these organizations are active for decades, but if what we are interested in is the triggering, triggering moment when they affiliate members of other organizations, this does the job. In fact, it's a kind of family tree, an elegant way to take into account temporality without making the graph vary, at the cost of expensive visualization sacrifice, of course. One way made relatively common by many visualization software is the addition of a slider that allows you to choose the portion of time you want to display. Efficient for exploration, it is less obvious to use for the average user. If you let the slider move by itself, as this system sometimes proposed by default, you are faced with a network that, that moves in all directions, jumps from one corner to another or of the screen, like a living cell under the microscope. We therefore lose part of the overall view, and it's difficult to follow the tra trajectory of a particular vertex. Note that the question of maintaining the so-called mental map of the network is a very current concern of the visual studies community. There's a lot of work on this subject at the moment. Another way to proceed uh, is to compute the total network and then maintain the position to create a shaded version on which, on which we superimpose only the vertices and edges that are actually activated at the chosen time. This works quite well if, as in this example, we visualize metadata or textual annotations, but it is mainly a way to make this temporality accessible to a public, not really an exploration and research tool. In many cases, we are left with static time slices. This is not always a very satisfactory solution, and it is often dictated by our means of publication. If we publish an article in a journal, in paper of, or PDF format, we cannot include interactive visualization. But often, it is also a way to be sure that the graphical representation on which we base our own interpretation is the same as the one we make av available to our reader, which we can never be sure of with an interactive visualization. In this case, it is clear that these one-year time slices do not allow us to read the network, other than in terms of its overall structure. 
we understand the increase in quantity, we see clusters forming and deforming, as well as certain vertices emerging from chaos, but it's impossible to delve into them more precisely. This is why an alternative visualization is proposed, on the right, a representation in which the position of the vertices is fixed according to a prosopographical classification, in order to observe only the evolution of the edges. This makes it possible to maintain this mental map, and even if the density of the network leaves no room for a diagrammatic reading anyway, it's easy to see which group is activated at which moment, and in connection with which other group. But still, even if playing with several specializations of the same datasets allows to compare an object from several, several angles, the rendering of temporality is problematic. The second modeling issue I want to introduce here is the study of networks expressing themselves on several levels or layers. We have seen that affiliation networks, two-mode networks, already contain a form of verticality. But when we are interested in historical objects, there are rarely only two types of vertices and relations. The problem we have when dealing with issues involving verticality is that we are technically and conceptually limited by the fact that we generally express ourselves in two dimensions and are unable to think in more than three dimensions. As in the examples here, we will therefore set up tricks to try to account for these different layers. This can be done by using different colors, positions or shapes for vertices and edges, for example. But this only works with small networks. Or we can create a false perspective in three dimensions, which relief effects to make clear the planes on which the elements are placed. But this false 3D is very quickly unreadable, and even an interactive visualization in three dimensions that we could turn in all directions or even explore with virtual reality device uh, would not solve our global vision problem. Otherwise, we can say goodbye to the dream of representing everything and use more conceptual visualizations, which allow us to show how our modeling is organized on well-arranged layers. Then. No more visualization. The data is modeled and the machine does the analysis work without visual output or with outputs located on one or more of these layers, but not all at the same time and without the edges between the layers. By introducing this article by Miko Kivela et al, uh, a landmark paper in the formalization of multilayer analysis, I know that I'm going far outside the spectrum of an introduction to network analysis. But I think it's, it's important to make you understand that we are in something that is happening now. Uh, and it needs to be given importance because our historical topics require complex modeling like this if we are to go beyond the obvious approach. Thinking of our historical object as a multi-layered system does not have to be complicated. We can keep things very simple, but it's es essential to be aware of potential layers or the facets with which to look at our dataset differently. Most of the time, we start from a simple layer, composed, for example, of individuals and interpersonal relationships. Often, these individuals also have relationships with entities located in another layer, for example, institution, with which they are affiliated. There are relationships on each of these layers, but also between them. Uh, in an affiliation network, it would be precisely the two-mode network that we'll project next. But we can imagine other levels with other layers and relationships within them. In our case, this could be the state entities above the institutions. And this multi-layered model can vary depending on several parameters. We can, for example, add a temporal dimension to it and observe the variations of the system along this axis. Or we can look at different types of relationships or different contexts, for example, the world of social relations, the world of economic relations, etc. In short, even if it looks like a conceptual monster, it is simply the reasoning that we already do when we prepare our network analysis. And let's be clear, the goal is not to create such a representation by mixing dozens of layers, but, but really to choose precisely which layer of or, or group of layers we want to study. In fact, this conceptual tool of multilayer network analysis should, should allow us to develop analysis scenarios. For example, we could work on a network for the circulation of goods and people between port cities. We would be interested in the level of local exchanges, then maritime traffic, then diplomatic relations between territories. The whole thing could be divided into several facets, depending on whether we are interested in different types of goods, etc. To use an example that has been used a lot previously, we could look at an affiliation network. 
but rather than working on the individual level, we, we would focus on several institutional layers, one level with organizations and one level with committees involved in this organization, for example. This would make it possible, for example, to see if the organizations have relationship with each other that correspond to the relational work they do at the meso-organizational level. Or, from a social history perspective, we could model interpersonal relationships that evolve over time. We will then be able to see if the evolution at the personal level is the same if we look at this social microcosm at the level of the groups in which individuals participate. So, all these questions are not really answered at the moment. But I hope that these few quick introductory chapters, while not giving you the technical and conceptual tools, have at least given you something to think about and encourage you to dig deeper. Thank you for your attention.